Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Nathan Winograd. Nathan Winograd is a graduate of Stanford Law School, a former criminal prosecutor and corporate attorney. He has spoken nationally and internationally on animal sheltering issues. He has written animal protection legislation at the state and national level and has created successful no-kill programs in both urban and rural communities. He has consulted with a wide range of animal protection groups, including some of the largest and best known in the nation. His work has been featured widely in such publications as Newsweek, Reader's Digest, USA Today, and newspapers from all over the country. He's appeared on Fox News, CNN, ABC, and other radio and television affiliates around the country. His creation of the country's first no-kill community was named one of the top 100 achievements in the nation by Metropolitan Home in its Best of the Best issue. And the Bark Magazine calls him the voice of America's displaced pets and the conscience of the animal sheltering industry. His book, Redemption, is the most critically acclaimed book on the topic in the United States and the winner of five National Book Awards. As a nationally recognized speaker, Nathan has spoken at national animal welfare conferences from coast to coast. He's spoken internationally as well in Canada and Australia and New Zealand, and has been invited to speak all over the world, including Ireland and the Czech Republic. He's also lectured on animal sheltering ethics to students at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine, the nation's number one ranked veterinary school, and has lectured at the UCLA School of Law on Animal Law Issues. In various leadership positions, including Director of Operations for the San Francisco SPCA, Nathan was instrumental in advancing some of the most progressive shelter programs in the nation and helped push the life-saving rate to over three times the national average for an urban community, and at the time, the best in the nation. As Executive Director for the Tompkins County, New York SPCA, he managed the full range of animal control and adoption services in a rural community, including construction of a new pet adoption center, achieving unprecedented results. Nathan is currently the Executive Director of the National No-Kill Advocacy Center and the author of five books. Redemption won five book awards and redefined the animal shelter industry nationwide. Irreconcilable Differences. His second book is an Indie Gold Medal winner for best book in the animals and pets category. His third book, All American Vegan, co-written with his wife Jennifer, was named best cookbook in the alternative health section by USA Book News in 2011 and was given a five-star review by San Francisco Book Review. Friendly Fire, also co-written with his wife, was published in October 2012. In 2014, he released a documentary film about the no-kill revolution in America and a film companion. Welcome Home, his fifth book, was published in 2017. You can learn more through his work with the No-Kill Advocacy Center by looking at his blog, his articles, and you can also find him on Facebook. Nathan, I'd like to welcome you to the show. It's my pleasure, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to have you today, and I want to also thank you for agreeing to join us and embarking on creating a super show. So this is going to be a part one and a part two show. We've actually never had the privilege of talking, and I have known of your work for years and years and years, and I'm just thrilled and honored, and I just I can't wait for our conversation, and I have two pages of questions already lined up for you here today. So I was wondering if you might be able to share with us first how you got started in animal welfare. Well, it started obviously as a very long time ago. Like you, I've been at this for uh, over 25 years now, but my story goes way back. My mom was one of the original cat ladies of the neighborhood <laughs> long before anyone used the term feral cat. You know, of course, the term community cat didn't exist. We didn't know what a humane trap was. She just took care of the neighborhood strays and we brought them into our home and found them homes or fed them in our yard. And when my older sister went off to college, she started taking care of the neighborhood cats. And so when I went off to college, I just thought, 
that's what people do. You go off, you move to a neighborhood, you start taking care of the neighborhood cats, and off you go. And But I really started getting involved on the animal welfare side when I went to law school. At the time, on the Stanford University campus, there were what the administration estimated to be about 1,000, 1,500 cats that made their home on the campus. And I got involved with a group called the Stanford Cat Network. And that was the group that trapped for sterilization the what we called feral cats back then, the feral cats that lived on campus. We built feeding stations. We fed them every day. We took care of them. And we resisted efforts first by the administration and later by outside groups to have those cats uh, rounded up and killed. That experience sort of led me to the local Humane Society and and then to learn about the policies of shelters, especially as it regards community cats. And then I became a board member of a local Humane Society, started uh, working on community cat programs and took off from there. So you said you learned mainly from your mom. So when you were taking care of community cats, she was trapping them and getting them spayed and neutered? Or was that something that you had learned when you went to Stanford? My mom, in terms of her relationship with community cats, goes way back. And this was before most people even sterilized cats. So way back in the 1970s, my mom would feed all the community cats. And when they gave birth, we would bring them into the house. We would raise the kittens. We would find homes for the kittens. It took a while, but eventually my mom started sterilizing them. That kind of work for me really began in earnest in the, you know, when I was in law school. This was the Stanford Cat Network is a very fascinating program. I mean, now it's not even controversial in many communities, but back then there wasn't any programs to TNR cats on campus. The standard response was to have the local shelter trap them and kill them. In fact, that's what the administration at Stanford wanted to do. They had announced that they were going to hire a pest control company to trap the cats and kill the cats. And the cat cat lovers on campus, the students, the faculty, the staff who cared for the cats objected. And ironically, they turned Stacy to the local Humane Society, thinking that caring for these cats would be within the humane mission of the Humane Society, which was naive because back then the Humane Society sided with the university and argued that because most of the cats were not social with humans, the university should trap them, but bring them to them to the humane society and then the humane society would put them to death and as you know you know for the cat lovers that was not a humane option and so in the naivety of the folks who eventually became the Stanford Cat Network they turned to some of the large national organizations thinking that caring for these cats would be within their humane mission especially since they use the name humane society in many cases and but those organizations also cited with the local pound in the university. And for me, that was my lesson in the dysfunction of the animal protection movement at the time and uh, how most organizations would round up and kill these cats rather than either find them homes or sterilize and release them back to their habitats if they weren't social with humans. So I learned about trapping and sterilization and re-releasing and feeding and took that knowledge to a local humane society society that eventually started a program that we called Community Cat Works, where we daily cared for about 2,000 community cats. Back then, as I said, we called them feral cats throughout the San Francisco Bay Area Peninsula. That's actually very interesting. I just had this bell or the bulb go off in my head. When I grew up, my mom had a cat before me, and uh, she got the cat spayed, and that was back in 1960. So you're saying that even up until the early 70s, it wasn't particularly common for folks to get their cat spayed or neutered. So I have to go back to my mom and thank her for being so progressive. Well, she was a visionary, clearly. I mean, (laughs) we used to uh, raise the kittens and find them homes. And it wasn't until my experiences when I went to law school in the early 1990s that I learned about sterilization and brought that home to my mom. And then eventually through programs with the local Humane Society. And then as my career progressed with larger organizations and larger numbers of cats. 
Yeah, because I would just walk blindly into pretty much any organization and just say it's got to be a given that every cat's going to get spayed or neutered because that was how I grew up. And so little did I know that we were really necessarily, you know, ahead of the game. So thank you for that story. And I wanted to find out in your process, when did you come up and think about developing the terminology around the word no kill? Well, I didn't really develop the terminology. It has been a industry term that is as old as sheltering itself. So, for example, you know, in the 19th century, when we first started to see SPCAs and humane societies be uh, implemented in response to some of the horrific practices of the local pounds. And I'll just give you an example. In the 19th century, New York City, like most relatively large cities around the country, every summer for a period of about 90 days, they would open up the pound to rid the streets of stray dogs and they would round them up and kill them, sometimes in the most brutal ways possible. And to respond to that, local animal lovers banded together to create organizations like Societies for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and local humane societies, among other things, to argue to leave the dogs alone. Most communities at the time didn't do anything about cats. But over time, these organizations left their founding mission. And in order to reduce some of the really brutal ways that dogs and later cats were being killed, things like drowning, shooting in some cities like Philadelphia, for example, the animals were beat to death in the public squares. So these organizations convinced a local government to let them take take over the pound work. And they did so because they thought they could do a better job. And in many ways they did. For the first time, they started offering some of these animals for adoption. They instituted humane education in order to teach people about what they called responsible pet care and uh, the importance of making lifetime commitments for the animals. And they introduced what they thought were more, quote unquote, humane ways of killing the animals. Some humane societies and some shelters never did that. They continued to focus on advocacy and holding the local pound accountable. And they differentiated themselves from those shelters that killed animals by using the term no kill. What we did in the 1990s, first in San Francisco under the visionary leadership of its then president, Richard Avanzino, and later in my work running an animal control shelter is to create what we wanted to is a no-kill community. So in other words, there have always been no-kill shelters, but there were no no no-kill communities. And that really was the focus of my work at the Cisco SPCA and later in Tompkins County, New York, where I actually took over a shelter that ran animal control that was the proverbial open admission shelter that took in all stray dogs and cats and rabbits and other animals that took in all owner surrendered, relinquished dogs, cats, and other animals that took in all feral cats and did the killing of all of them except those who were truly irremediably suffering. So in the 1990s, Tompkins County, New York, it may not have been the first community that had, say, a 90% plus live release rate, but it was certainly the first open admission shelter that took in feral, you know, or community cats and saved them all. If you like the Community Cats podcast and would like to help promote community cats in your state, then we need you. We're looking for a couple of people from each state to be Community Cats ambassadors. What do you get by being an ambassador? You'll be mailed a promo kit of items to use to help promote the show at any event that you attend in your state. If you don't attend many events, hey, that's okay too. Do you have a network of people that love community cats? You can help with email and groups in your state to let them know about the CCP and offer them the benefit of community cat swag. The more we can spread the word about the show, the more we can do to help cats across the country. Please email Stacy S-T-A-C-Y, at communitycatspodcast.com if you'd like to represent your state. Thank you. I want to hear from you what the Community Cats Podcast means to you. You can now leave a recorded testimonial on the Community Cats Podcast website and share your thoughts about the show. You can also ask questions, share show ideas, pretty much anything you want. 
Just go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on the testimonial link and record. You hear from me all of the time, and now I want to hear from you. Thank you. I think we were following in the same time frame. We, in uh, 2003, created our open admission model for a designated geographic area. And so we were treating cats in that framework. So it was sort of in that same mindset. When were you at Tompkins County? This was 2001. So in the same, we were sort of in that same period. And obviously you had a big learning curve. You learned a lot in San Francisco that you then brought to Tompkins County. You went from changing a mindset from one way going into that organization, basically walking in the doors or what I have read, you sort of walked in the doors and in walked with you, you know, people with various litters of kittens and there was overcrowding and you basically walked in and said, you know, today we're changing the way things are done. Some people believe that that's not possible to do. I personally believe it is totally possible to do. And I think that always trying something that seems new and different is always a good idea as long as it makes sense. But from your standpoint, when you entered into that situation, was it just that you had faith that change was going to work? Well, it was more than faith, Stacy. You know, I came to Tompkins County, New York with my experiences in San Francisco. Now, San Francisco didn't achieve no kill, but at the time it had, if not the lowest, certainly one of the lowest death rates of any major urban cities in the United States. And it did pioneer, at least for a large urban city and an animal shelter system, some really innovative work on the community cat side. So we were sterilizing thousands of community cats for free. We had negotiated with the uh, U.S. Navy. I believe we were the first to sign an agreement to do community cat sterilization on a military installation at Treasure Island. We had negotiated with the San Francisco Housing Authority to allow community cats sterilization on uh, all 11 of their properties. We succeeded in passing a law statewide in California that made it illegal for shelters, regardless of whether they are public municipal shelters or private shelters, to kill community cats if a rescue group or TNR group was willing to save those cats. So in other words, if a shelter was going to kill a community cat, the rescue group can what we call red carding, put a card on the cat's cage or kennel and say, I will take that cat and it would make it illegal for the shelter to kill the cat. They had to turn the cat over. And we succeeded in reducing the deaths of community cats in the city at the time by around 75%. We reduce the death rate for kittens by about 85%. So that and all the other programs for dogs and for adult cats and friendly cats, that was the experience that I brought to Tompkins County. The difference was, whereas the San Francisco SPCA was a private organization, I wanted to bring those programs to a shelter that ran the animal control facility. In other words, to, as I said, to the proverbial open door shelter that was required to take in all animals that were brought to the facility. And given that when I got there, or the day before I got there, it was killing animals. I didn't have the luxury of time to implement those programs over time. So I told my staff that henceforth and going forward, we were going to save every dog, cat, rabbit, hamster, goat. You know, we occasionally even got in stray chickens, cows, and horses <laughs> that came through our doors. And it was a very challenging summer. It was a very challenging first year, but we did it. Since then, there are now hundreds of cities and towns across the United States that have also reduced the killing so that they have live release rates in excess of 95%. To the critics who say that it can't be done overnight, virtually 
I would say most, most of the hundreds of communities that are now saving between 95% and 99% of all dogs and cats in their facilities did it in six months or less. And many of them, in fact, did it overnight. So something can't be impossible if it has already been achieved, not just once, but dozens of times. So it's not necessarily getting the spay neuter out there, but it's also a mind shift. Exactly. And, you know, I've long argued for 20 plus years that it's actually the policies and procedures of the shelter that are responsible for whether animals die in shelters. So, you know, I'm not naive. Having been a criminal prosecutor and worked on a number of animal cruelty cases, having been an animal control officer, having been the chief of animal control, having run shelters and consulted with shelters, including me municipal shelters all over the country, in fact, all over the world. Look, I've seen firsthand the results of human irresponsibility, but I've also seen what happens when shelters don't give in to that human irresponsibility. In other words, while people surrender animals to shelters, it's the shelters that kill them. And one doesn't necessarily follow or excuse the other. And what shelter managers do once the animals are in their care and and what they do to responsibly reduce the number of animals that come in. So, for example, by providing subsidized medical care or food or helping people find housing or affordable sterilization, pet retention counseling, the kinds of things that we did in San Francisco and that we did in Tompkins, not only to increase adoptions, but to responsibly reduce intakes, to reduce births and to help keep animals with their responsible caretakers. So you are referencing to that creation of the no-kill community being a much more important factor than the shelter live release rate percentages. Those are important, but yet they're not a measure of your overall program success. How would you measure a successful no-kill community? First and foremost, when we're talking about a no-kill community, we are, of course, talking about animals living instead of dying. So that live release rate is perhaps the most crucial measure. And what we're seeing, if if we're talking cats here, we're seeing communities with live release rates as high as 98%, even 99%. I mean, a few communities will finish a year with 100% live release rate for cats, but that to me is less interesting, ironically, than and those that are at 99%, 98% and have been so for a number of years simply because inevitably every shelter will take in a cat who is truly irremediably suffering. And for that cat, the term euthanasia will be its dictionary definition. And I'm, of course, thinking about the cat that has been hit by a car and is truly suffering and has multiple medical conditions and is in, for example, a multiple organ system failure where there's nothing absolutely we can do for that cat. And you euthanasia is the humane outcome. Given that we no kill means not killing animals who are not irremediably suffering, that is the key measure. But how we achieve that measure goes well beyond the four walls of the shelter. It does mean, for example, helping cats in the community so that they don't enter the shelter. It does mean partnering with local businesses. So, for example, when I was in Tompkins County and people called because because they were moving or they aren't allowed to have cats and their landlord found out and they didn't know what to do. We had a list of apartments and homes for rent in the community that did allow cats and we would help them find housing. And we worked to expand the number of landlords that allowed cats. And we can talk about the different ways we did that. If they were having, say, litter box issues, we had free behavioral counseling and a lot of it was resolved on the phone. But if needed, we would send the behaviorists to their home to uh, help resolve the problem so that they can overcome the challenges that they might be facing with their animals. And so through a whole host of community-based programs, empowering community cat advocates. So for example, we'd go to bat for them if they had conflicts with their neighbors and we would resolve those. We would work with the local health department Department to sterilize rather than round up cats. And we did that even when cats tested positive for rabies. 
In upstate New York, at least back then, it was considered a rabies watch community. And once or twice we had a cat that bit somebody that tested positive for rabies. And usually the reactionary response by health departments is to round up and kill the cats. But we developed a very strong and robust partnership with our health department where we would go in and we would trap all the cats and we would test them all and we would sterilize them all and we would release them all and resolve any potential issues in a very humane way. So the combination of all those programs outside the shelter, the robustness of our life-affirming programs in the shelter allowed us to create a no-kill community. And since that time, I've been working with shelters, as I said, all over the country and all over the world to do the same thing. So we're going to wrap up part one with one final question here. What do you think life will be like for community cats 10 years from now? Uh, it's a great question, and uh, you know, I'm sure I'll think of more things long after our conversation ends. But when I look to the future, there are several things that I think will be incredibly striking beyond the fact that we will continue to move in a more life-affirming direction so that more and more communities are no-kill, so that community cats no longer face being killed in any shelter in the country. And whether that's in 10 years or five years or beyond that, I know we're going to be moving aggressively in that direction until all shelters are no-kill shelters and that becomes the norm. But I think we're going to do a number of much broader things. So I hope to see in the next 10 years or so that we change the law in this country so that it reflects the rights of cats and the way people feel about them. So that the law, for example, acknowledges that cats are family members and not property, and they should have all the rights that flow from that acknowledgement. In the law, we call that legal personhood. And that means that if there is, for example, a conflict with community cats, that the default won't necessarily be rounding up and killing them, but that the cats will have representation in the courts, if need be, what we call a, a guardian ad litem, where an attorney is appointed to cats. And actually, we're starting to see that in other countries and even in this country. In Connecticut, for example, cat and dog victims of cruelty don't just have the prosecutor that's prosecuting the perpetrator, but the cats are actually appointed a guardian, an attorney who represents that cat in the court hearing and argues for the best interest of the cats. We're starting to see also, for example, in the United States, Stacey, laws that protect cats in cases of divorce like a human child. So the court would have to consider the best interest of the cat in terms of awarding custody. And while some people might think that's no big deal, it is really a profound change. If you go back just 10 years or so, there was a case where the divorcing couple were arguing about their animal and one of the two argued for visitation rights to visit their animal and the court ruled that animals were property and they made no sense for the court to get involved in visitation because it would be akin to creating visitation rights for a toaster. Now we're starting to see laws and I hope in the next 10 years we see more of them that recognize the legal personhood of cats so that their rights are defended in court by an attorney if need be. I'd also like to see, if I can close, I mean, there's more. I'd like to see veterinary care as a right for cats. I would like to see that we determine going outside is healthy for cats. And if you look at all the epidemiological evidence out there, cats that are allowed to go outdoors tend to have lower health problems, but there's attendant risks to go outdoors. And there's risks because we haven't created an outdoor environment that took the interest of cats in mind when they were created. So I'd like to see society evolve to consider the interests of cats outdoors. That would be making it safe for for example, through emerging self-driving technologies, land bridges, so cats can cross roads without concern. And finally, since I know I'm pushing the time limit here, <laughs> I'd like to see laws, and I think we will see laws in every state that recognize the emotional and psychological needs of cats. So right now, our laws demand that a cat receive the basic requirements of sustenance and shelter, but there is no legal mandate to provide love and attention. 
attention. So not a single U.S. state has an animal cruelty statute that acknowledges emotional neglect or suffering. And that is not necessarily true in other countries. And in the next 10 years, I hope that's not necessarily true in the U.S. either. Thank you for listening to a Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more Community Cats. 